Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is a member of the PAC, brand new member of the PAC, uh, Braden Layer. Uh, the new head football coach of the Allegheny Gators. Um, he graduated in 2012 from Denison, so he's a Division Three guy who has gone up and down through the ranks uh, as a coach. This is his second stint in uh, Allegheny. And before I go any further, as I do every week, thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for listening on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. Make sure you hit that little bell or like and subscribe button whether it be youtube or the podcast that you're listening to you can also follow us on the twitter instagram tiktok and facebook page the only one that's different is the instagram page which is dingo underscore talk uh we're going to talk to coach layer about what the plan is here as a brand new coach coming into the conference the second brand new pac coach that we are talking to uh here on the program um and then again we're just going to get to know the coach get to know what he thinks about the PAC why this was the right choice for him and uh I don't know we're gonna tell his story because that's what the job is so without further ado this is coach Lair. what's going on chuckleheads I am Carlo Guadagnino this is Dingo Talk my guest this week is head football coach of Allegheny uh Brendan Lair. did I say that right coach but Braden Lair. Braden, Braden Lair. Braden Lair. yeah I wrote it I wrote it all funky there so you know see Take notes at home. Make sure you can read your writing when you're going to write notes down. So, Coach, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me on. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. So we're going to do this the way we do every week. I'm going to take you back to 2008. Uh, we're going to work our way forward. So how did you find yourself at Denison? Yeah, so I actually did not come from too far down the road. I, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Um, went to a really strong uh, public high school on the west side of Columbus, Upper Arlington, um, and, and kind of through the recruiting process, you know, every kid at some point thinks they're going to play for Ohio State if you grow up in that area of the state, um, and, and especially with my family going there. So um, I, I think it probably took me a little bit longer than others to realize that that I was not an FBS football player, um, but I, I thought Denison um, really just did a great job of, of recruiting me throughout my junior and senior year. Um didn't try to come on too late, just kind of understood that, hey, um, we'll, we'll be there in the end, right? And, and they did a great job um, really from start to end. So I, I thought maybe I was going to go to the University of Dayton, maybe Hillsdale, um, ended up getting walk-on opportunities at both those places and, and ultimately decided I wanted to go someplace where if I knew I only had 40 games left in my career, I, I wanted to try to make the most of those. Um, and, and especially at, at Upper Arlington, um, you know, I was a special teams player my sophomore and junior year and, and really only had one year as a starter. So mm -hmm. really wanted to go someplace where I felt like I, I could make a difference in my four years. Now, has that has that recruitment process helped you with the way you recruit players uh, as you're going out in the off seasons? Is that kind of a mentality of, listen, we're going to be here. Um, do your do your due diligence. Go through what you need to go through. We're here to talk if you need it. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and, and I might have a different approach than, than others, but I, I think division three recruiting, you kind of get put in one of two buckets. Um, and, and one is that early bucket of players that really understand that, hey, I love the division three mentality. I love everything that being a true student athlete stands for. And, you know, right now in the calendar year for the 2024 recruits, there are plenty of kids that are super excited to hear from us, right? And, and hear from other schools in the pack. Um, and, and those are the guys that are we're, we're pushing and, and fighting like heck to get up on our campus, um, to have them up here for a couple hours just to show what we have got going on and, and all the exciting new things that we believe are in the future for Allegheny. Um, and then that second bucket is is more of the slow play, right? You got to keep them warm. You, you got to understand that um, no matter what happens, you still want to make sure you're in touch enough to where Allegheny is constantly on their mind, right? And, mm -hmm. and they know that ultimately um, if a bo bigger program doesn't work out or they decide maybe that preferred walk-on just isn't for me and mm -hmm. I want to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond, um, and this coaching staff at Allegheny has at least been in touch since the very beginning. So that, that's kind of bucket two for me. So making sure, and especially Division three, you can cast such a wide net and a big mm -hmm. net it helps you not spread yourself too thin throughout the recruiting cycle. Now, so as you said, there's most of us, we get 40 games or less, depending on how 
football being the sport that it is, it can be, it can go away very quickly. After those four, 40 games in 2012, why the decision to go to Austin P? Yeah, so I, I don't know how much time we have here. So it, it wasn't an initial decision. I actually took a job as a sports writer. Um, so I, I was a, a sports writer at a town called Effingham, Illinois, um, really small daily publication. And I was covering high school and honestly, a lot of middle school sports. Um, and that was something that, you know, I was a, a broadcast journalism major at Denison. And um, I always thought I wanted to do something. I wasn't sure if it was TV, um, if it was going to be radio, if it was going to be print journalism. And, and ultimately, my first spot was in print journalism out of college. And, and I kind of got the itch. I, I had been working there for seven or eight months. Football season was coming back around. And I tried to volunteer my time or reach out to local high school coaches um, just saying, hey, I'd love to help. And, and mm -hmm. more often than not, I, I heard nothing, wh which was kind of surprising. You know, I had a successful college career. I felt like I could offer something, especially uh, to some smaller high schools that were around the area that, that I'm sure were short a coach here or there. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, I had gotten a little bit frustrated and a friend of mine introduced me to uh, what everyone knows, um, football scoop. So it, it was kind of crazy how it all happens. But the first day I was on football scoop, there was a posting. Uh, um, for a GA job at, at Austin P. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know any better at that point. So I, I just hopped on, I, I read kind of the ad and the posting and, you know, now looking back, it's crazy, but it didn't say to send a resume. It didn't say to have a reference call. Um, at that point, I believe they were nine or eight days into their fall camp already and just had to make a hire. Mm -hmm. um, whoever their GA was, and, and I forget the name, um, ended up getting a camp invite to the Chargers. So wow. at the last second, um, they had a change there and, and I called the head coach because his number was on the posting, Kirby Cannon. Um, I, I owe him the world. Uh, we hit it off in an hour or two on the phone. I, I took my GRE the next morning and in 72 hours, I was moving down to Clarksville um, to get ready to play against the University of Tennessee. So it was quite a crazy three or four day stretch. That's for sure. Now, what was what was the two years at Austin P like for you as a because that's you now you're you're on the other side, right? You're no longer the guy strap was putting the, putting the pads on, you're the guy getting everybody ready. What was that like? Uh, it was craziness at first, just because, like I said, I, I got there a week and a half almost into camp where, you mm -hmm. know, the defense had been installed, you know, they were starting to gel. Everybody knew what was going on. And, and I, I look back on it now and it was probably a blessing in disguise because it was such a sink or swim moment, right? Where it, it could have been very easy to go there, become completely overwhelmed because everything was new from the schemes of the defense to the technique that we're teaching to, you know, I, I talked about that Tennessee game. Um, as far as our staffing was concerned, it was me and one other defensive assistant in the press box. So, you know, trying to get ready for an SEC opponent. And then in the second quarter and the third quarter, having to pick that up quickly and relay to the head coach, to the defensive coordinator and to the entire staff, you know, what the offense was doing, what gap it hit in, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think was just absolutely paramount in confidence more than anything um, and, and feeling that I, and I could handle it at that level in a GA role. And I got to dip my toes a little bit in recruiting, mm -hmm. um, not too much, obviously, as a graduate assistant and you don't get to go out on the road and do all that stuff. But I, I thought more than anything, it helped with confidence and it helped with relationships um, just because for me, it, it was a division three player and I had an OK career. Um, and then I go to the division one level and, and honestly, those kids don't care, right? You, you got to really show how much, you know, how much you care about them and prove that you belong. So I, I thought that was really important to me as well. Now let's talk about that atmosphere before we jump down to, to where you leave, when you leave Austin P what's the atmosphere like at an sec game when you're the guy up in the booth, trying to manage all of that, plus the noise and everything else that goes into a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, I, I think I was more excited than the players, to be honest with you. There, there was a, a couple of Denison games in the NCAC for sure that I'm not sure we cracked a thousand fans. And there were plenty that did. But to go from a thousand to, I don't know what it is, 107 or 108,000 for the home opener, uh, that, that was a different thing entirely. And then, you know, the rules have now changed where you have to wear like the warm ups with the number on it um, yeah. just in case anything happens pregame. But, you know, naturally it gets a little chippy. Um, so before the game, a couple of our guys, you know, started talking and, and a couple of Tennessee guys started talking. And I just thought to myself that there's no way we would want to go after these guys right, right now before the home opener. So um, it, it was an awesome, awesome experience. That's for sure. So two seasons, you get your master's from Austin P and then it's time to go back home. Huh? Why yes, the decision yeah, to return home? 
Yeah. So I, I was really lucky. Um, I was actually only at Austin P for one season. I was able to accelerate the masters into a one-year program. So um, I just kind of took like double the classes each semester that allowed me to be done in one year. Um, and then I just got the call um, from my mentor, Jack Hatem. Um, you know, he, he was someone that recruited me um, going back to the start of this podcast and that interview. Um, met him at a Miami, Ohio camp, stayed in touch with him for the better course of a year. Um, ended up committing to play there. He was the defensive coordinator for two seasons um, and then became our head coach. So I finished my playing career at Denison um, with him. And I think more than anything, the, the places I've been in my career and, and trying to handle some of the turnarounds and the builds and, and really creating success um, from programs that maybe hadn't had it at mm -hmm. least recently. Um, he, he was incredibly instrumental. He does everything the right way. He knows how to build a culture. He knows how to build a program. So I, I think for me, having played in that, I, I kind of sensed how valuable it might be to go back and work for him um, and, and spend some time there. And selfishly, you know, we were a 500 program the end of my career there. Um, I, I wanted to see Denison take the next step, right, and, and get to a, a point to where they could compete for conference championships and a spot in the Division Three playoffs. Well, and the and the, the... – it's the NCAC, right? Is the it is yes. That's a it's a it's not an easy conference. We've started we've started down that pack as we're moving out of the OAC in the pack. We're starting to go into a couple other conferences, and some of the coaches that we talk to, it's very similar to the OAC in the pack. Where not don't bring your best game on a Saturday. You're going to be getting on the bus with an L. It doesn't matter top to bottom of the conference who you're playing. So, no no doubt about it. I I think. You know, when I was a player, I, I believe Wittenberg and Wabash both had quarterfinal runs. You know, mm -hmm. one one year, uh, one gave Whitewater everything they could handle. And, and then the other year, I, I think it was Wabash and, and Mount Union in like a 20 to 10 game in, in the quarterfinals. Um, that, that could have gone either way. So it, it is an incredibly strong conference, no doubt. Now, after your time at Denison, I noticed that, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, because I'm looking at my notes here and I already screwed up one of these. So um, is it Swanee? Is that the Swanee? Yeah. The, the Safeway is just calling it the university of the South, which is they're an original sec member, right? They were an original sec and then they left. Yes, correct. Okay. They're probably most famous too. Um, there's a documentary. I think it was by PBS. It uh, came out in the last few years called the Iron Man. Um, mm -hmm. So that was like plastered all over our facility and everything there but beat all, all the SEC teams, I want to say in seven days or something like that. So they played a game, traveled to the next city, all on the road, knocked every single one of them down one by one um, on an undefeated season. That's a uh, that's not a story that many teams are going to get to tell in their no. history. No, um, absolutely not. So what was that experience like? It was great. Um, again, just something where you don't know any better at that time. Um, and kind of looking back again, Tommy Laurendine was the head coach that I worked for, but can't say enough good things about him and in the trust that he had in me at that point, I was 26 years old and I was given the opportunity to coordinate an offense. Um, and, and I've been really blessed at a couple different ventures in my career. And that's certainly one of them. Um, I was hired in March or April, um, I believe. And I believe maybe one or two weeks after I got to campus, we had signed up for an abroad trip to Ireland. So we used that division three rule. And, and I think W and J just did a trip um, maybe yeah. last week um, where you can do the abroad experience once every four years, you're allowed to have extra padded practices, you know, all that kind of stuff. And what an unbelievable trip for your players to get enjoy too. So we did an Ireland trip. Um, and while we were over there, we played the Belfast Trojans in Northern Ireland and, and, um, you know, we, they had been a triple option team. Um, part of the reasons I was hired was, was to kind of go more towards the pistol spread or some of the stuff we were doing at Denison. So mm -hmm. because it was that kind of an experience originally, he just said, you know, Braden, why don't you call it while we're over there? And I said, sure, more than happy to. And, um, we had some success, had a great experience. Um, but I, I guess he saw something that he really liked. Um, and, and I ended up being able to call the plays that fall. And, and that was something where, you know, I, I hope maybe I'd get the chance to do that two or three years down the road. Um, but ultimately had the chance to do that right away. So uh, again, I, I think being thrown into the deep end with that and, and having unbelievable guidance too. Like he was fantastic. Chris Shank um, was our co-offensive coordinator. You know, we, we certainly worked very well together and, and owe him a ton as well. But um, again, just, just kind of embracing the challenge, I guess, um, and, and going with that and, and making sure that 
we felt like we always put our best foot forward going into Saturday um, and, and more than anything, got the buy-in of the players for what we were doing. Now let's, can we talk about the, the, the international trip once every four years now, is that both to help spread the game overseas? Is that more what the goal is or is the goal just, you know, each, like you said, everybody gets a chance every four years different teams get to go to different places. They get their players to different places. It's just kind of, and it's good for the program. It's good for where you're going and, and all parties involved. I think any way you slice it, it's beneficial. Um, and I think in college football, everything comes back to at some point recruiting. Um, and, and there's no doubt in my mind that that helps saying that you're a program that's interested in taking those abroad trips and, especially maybe for the players that aren't interested in an entire semester abroad. This is a mini study abroad, right? This is a mini experience, a mini immersion trip where you can go, you know, somewhere, learn the culture. You're only going to practice two or three times while you're there. So it is truly more of a cultural experience. Um, and then, like you said, you know, we played the Belfast Trojans and I, I joke their average age was somewhere around 45, I swear. <laughs> um, but you know, the stands were packed. Families were there for a lot of people. You know, they had watched some games, um, you know, on TV, but they'd never experienced American football in person. It was a club. It was, you know, something to do, you know, on the weekends in their free time. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that wherever an American team goes, um, you know, that local experience is huge in terms of growing the game as well. And especially now, you know, you see it once every couple of years in the NFL draft where there's, you know, a player from abroad that gets drafted. You see it more and more in college football, especially at the FBS level, you know, whether it's an offensive defensive lineman, um, a punter something like that, you know, that the game is certainly growing. Um, and, and I do think for our guys too, they loved the team bonding aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm can't replicate that you you can't because it's just such a different experience you're off campus um and, and families got to be involved as well so I, I think more than anything it really built the unity of the team so you have your one year in the university of the south and then it's stop one where you are now in allegheny now why did that feel like the right fit at that time I had the chance um, when I was a player, Coach Hammer, you know, what was a coach at Wabash College. Um, and then even as a coach, I, I had a chance to coach against him, um, you know, back in 2014 and 2015, where I, I believe uh, he's going to hate me for saying this. I'm going to say they were the number one ranked defense. I can't remember if they were one or two. I'm, I'm pretty sure they were number one um, in the entire country in, in total defense and, and were number one in like eight out of 10 cat categories. So having a game plan against that, um, what an unbelievable nightmare, you know, it kept you up late at night. Uh, so the respect I had for what he was able to do there. And, and again, going back to the 20 to 10 Mount Union game or 20 to eight Mount Union game, um, obviously very influential in that experience. So having to prepare for for one of his defenses um, and then seeing that he was at Allegheny, um, you know, definitely piqued my interest. Um, I had played against Allegheny being a Denison student athlete, um, had a couple really tough fourth quarter losses against him. So I knew that they weren't afraid to battle. Um, you know, they had tough, hard nosed Western Pennsylvania kids. And then I think when I got the chance to go up to campus and, and be part of the interview process, and I still feel the same way right now, and it's not that much different um, I truly believe this place has the chance to snowball. Um, and, and I believe that it did back then um, as far as one or two things starting to head in the right direction and just gaining more and more momentum. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to jump ahead of, of the podcast here, but we were very lucky. I mean, we, we went from a, a tough situation to six and four in, in two years and, and reestablished a, a winning season, um, which more than any part of my college career in coaching, um, I'm the most proud of, right? Mm -hmm. And as far as what that group of seniors who came in at 0 and 10, and then by their senior year, reestablished Allegheny as a winning football program again at six and four. Um, that's still who I call first in this profession, or that's who I love hearing from. If they text me saying, hey, I just got a new job or coach, do you need help with this recruit? I just saw we were talking with him. Um, you know, th those guys in the pr pride that they feel towards that rebuild second to none. So it's interesting. Um, we had Coach Sirianni, C Coach Sirianni on a couple weeks ago. And I asked him, you know, there are two, there are two new coaches in the conference. And I asked him, you know, any, any insight or you, or you think not much to say about Teal and coach Bauman, a lot to say about the Allegheny program and how maybe people have forgotten how good Allegheny was for many years. 
And it, it it is starting to snowball again, where it seems that the things are moving in the right direction. And it's not an easy trip. And hearing Coach Sirianni say that, um, there's a couple other coaches that we've had from the PAC that specifically mentioned Allegheny. And, and it's great to have you guys back into the conference. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I want to skip ahead, but why was the Allegheny job the job – the right job for you now. Yeah. I mean, I think I kind of hit on it, but I I still believe there is the chance to do this, you know, the right way and build on it. And and I think more than anything, my wife and I got engaged here. You know, I I have such fond memories of the college of the community of Northwest Pennsylvania. And and man, I love the kids that commit to play here. I I Mm -hmm. love their character. I love their mentality. Um, I really like the lunch pail roll up your sleeves, let's get to work kind of ideals that work here. Um, and I do think what's really nice for us is we have that mentality, we have that blue collar edge, or we did when we left and we're redeveloping, right? We, we've got to make sure we get back to that point. But because of the academic prestige um, and the fact that we're still the highest ranked liberal arts college in the pack, um, we've got to control our backyard. We've got to start winning some battles against a W and J, against a Westminster, against a Grove City in recruiting, whether that's five in year one to 10 in year two to 15 in year three. I believe it can be done. But I also know that because of the academic prowess, we can stretch a little bit more and, and we can pull a couple kids from all other areas of the country. And even in this 2023 recruiting class, we're darn near double digits from Texas, which, you know, honestly caught me a little bit by surprise. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll, we'll always be able to get a couple from Florida, always be able to get Ohio and, and New York, which is still kind of in that two hour radius. But all of the other areas um, are, are where I feel like we can have a chance to separate just a little bit um, in recruiting sooner rather than later, too. Um, and and I, I do believe from the top down, um, and, and every small college coach would say this, you have to feel supported. And man, did I feel that in the interview process, um, you know, from President Cole, our new president, Bill Ross, the athletic director, to everybody I met on the search committee. Um, I think they're hungry for football to be good again. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you talk to the board of trustees, you talk to the football alumni. Um, and, and I love selling it to recruits because I think sometimes they forget. And you mentioned it. You know, in our history, we are a true blue blood division three football program with yeah, sure. over 500 program wins and, and all the different things that we have is great. Um, and now we're trying to breathe some life to some certain areas. I know my office looks pretty old behind me, but if I take you out into the hallway, we're building a brand new football specific facility this summer. I don't want to give away too many secrets, but we're, we're going to have a pretty nice setup here um, come August. So I, I definitely felt the commitment from everybody at the college as well. Now, when we're talking about recruits, what are you looking for in your student athlete? Yeah, we're, we're pretty simple. And, and I'm not necessarily a huge, um, and, and I learned this from Coach Hammer, just kind of his approach to it. Um, and, and I loved it. Not, not a huge slogan guy, not a huge mm-hmm. print it on a t-shirt and wear it in the weight room. We've got something different every spring or every fall. Um, the best thing that, that he taught me is culture is live, right? What, what our guys do every single day and how they approach being an Allegheny football player it is by their experiences and what they do from the moment they wake up to the morning they go to bed. Um, you know, we, we don't really live in, in the gray area. We're very black and white in our recruitment and the players that we're trying to have here. We keep it simple. We want guys that are passionate about competition. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. If you're passionate about competition, a lot of that other stuff's going to take care of itself. So we want guys that, you know, very much anticipate coming and making a difference in our program before their senior year. We don't want to recruit guys that are comfortable waiting for three years to see the field. We want that mentality of, hey, we're trying to turn this football program around from the minute that we step foot on campus. Um, We've told every single prospect we will play the best football player regardless of age. Um, That's how college football should work. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's something that we really approach. And, And with that competitive aspect, if you're a true competitor, it means you don't just compete on the field. It's also in the classroom so we raised our gpa i think 0.14 this spring which is fantastic you know we do a very quick congratulations to the team we enjoy it for a day and then we understand that hey you know that next semester if we were a 3.04 we want to be a 3.05 right Mm -hmm. it's constantly raising the bar um, and having that competitive mindset and then in the community too I, i think there's just such a great opportunity here to make Allegheny football the big ticket item in really a half hour radius of a pretty strong population of people um, in a group of the country that really loves college football. 
Um, so we strive for five. That, that's just kind of our, our mentality of community service events, ways that we can get ourselves involved in Meadville, um, in the local schools, community, you name it. So if, if you're a competitor, it means really in those three aspects, you're always going to try to get better. Um, you're never going to be complacent. Now, we talked about the NCAC. What is, how good is the PAC? And I say that in that way because the OAC coaches have dubbed themselves the SEC of Division Three. <laughs> I've talked to some Empire Eight schools who say, you know, it's really easy to be a good Division Three school when you don't have a Division Two programs to compete against, like they do in New York. Um, mm -hmm. And we've talked to some MAC schools and some NCAC schools, and they both, it's you know, look at the at the end of the year, look at the standings, look at the tw top twenty-five. We're we're in there too. So, what makes the PAC so special? I, I really believe, and and I'm trying not to use just the generic coach speak here. Um, so I, I think what stood out to me in watching film is the physicality of it, um, especially up front. I, I felt like, and, and I'm an NCAC player at heart, so I, I don't mean this to diminish the conference whatsoever, um, but at least watching film, I, I did feel like, the fronts were more physical. Um, it, it was a, a little bit of a, a harder nosed game um, mm -hmm. in, in watching film. And, and that's where more than anything, we have to make dramatic improvements. Um, again, working for a guy like Coach Hammer, where, you know, the weight room was the priority all the mm -hmm. time. And, and that was a huge reason why we got better everywhere that he went. Uh, that, that's something that we have to embrace again, right? We, we have to make sure, and, and our guys kind of heard it going into the summer, um, our strength program and, and what we do in strength and conditioning this summer should be the hardest in the conference. And, yeah. and they shouldn't want it any other way. Cause if we do something that the other teams are doing, or we're not working as hard as other teams, we're not going to close the gap, right? We, we have to understand that we need the hardest program in our conference in order to start gaining ground on some teams where there is a physical gap when you turn on the film um, from last season. So I think that's what jumped off the page most to me. And, and then I think, um, the, the top top teams in our conference are as good as anybody in the country. I mean, shoot, Carnegie Mellon played North Central as well as anybody, including Mount Union, outside of a, a late rally there. So um, there, there is unbelievable football, which, you know, you kind of mentioned it. I think the most surprising thing, and it really speaks to the talent in, in the two-hour radius of all the schools in our conference, is you still have the OAC that recruits this area. Right. You've got the Empire Eight that will recruit Western New York. You've got the PSAC and the Division Two schools that will recruit everywhere around here. And there's still enough good football players or the strength of the programs, the history and the cultures with these coaches in this conference allows these teams to stay strong every single year. So, um, I mean, I guess going back to another one of the reasons why I felt like this was the right time. Uh, it's another sink or swim moment, right? I mean, you're, you're going into a conference where you've got to prove yourself right away. That's not lost on me. And, um, you know, we, we've hit the ground running because we understand if we're taking a day or two off and, and we're not recruiting every single day, man, you better believe Grove City is or W&J is or Westminster is or Waynesburg, or you name it, Teal. Everybody in our conference is going to be after it. And it's not like there's any school in the Whippeal or in District 10 where there's a couple kids that no one knows about in our conference, right? If you're going to visit one of our schools, chances are you're going to visit five or six. So you better yeah. be good enough to stand apart. Now, so we covered the PAC. What's the significance or the importance of Division Three? And you've covered a lot of things, I think, throughout this interview that are really good qualities of a Division Three athlete. But if you could put it all, summarize it a little bit, what is the importance of Division Three? It's the whole experience um, It's the fact that, that you don't kind of just get put into a label, into a box and, and hey, I'm a football player and I go to the school uh, and, and I draw upon my experience a little bit when I'm selling, you know, the division three mentality to a lot of students, um, because I, I really do believe in it. I, I believe in everything that division three stands for. Um, in my four years at Denison, I had three internships. I wrote for the school newspaper. I had a sports talk show um, on the school's radio station. You know, I, I was able to work and do like work study, capped out my work study and track meets and basketball games and, and all sorts of different things and recruiting assistants. So I, I think what you get here um, is the absolute embodiment of what it means to be a student athlete um, and, and put student first. So I, I think that's really important. And then I, again, as far as Allegheny specific, and I'm going to choose these words carefully. There, there's so many Division Three opportunities, and I always felt like I wanted to go to a place where I believed in what I was selling, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, what, when you look at the cost, when you look at the financial aid, when you look at the out-of-pocket, the roster sizes, 
the quality of education. I, I wanted to make sure if I was talking to student athletes, if I was talking to families, I never felt guilty um, about what I was trying to sell or what I was trying to encourage families to pay. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've done a really good job these last two or three months in recruiting to get our class to a very healthy number. Um, and, and I haven't felt that once. I, I really believe for a lot of these young men that we're recruiting, Allegheny has the opportunity to change their life um, for mm -hmm. the better, right? And, and I'm, I'm very transparent in telling them that um, we will never, ever, ever negatively recruit. I, I think that's terrible. Um, but you better believe we're extremely positive about Allegheny and what Gator football and what the college can do for them. Now, uh, what would you say the message to those alumni that, that you talked about earlier, to the administrators and to the team, what's the message coming out of uh, Allegheny for the 2023 season? I, I think more than anything, I hope they see a team that's hungry every week. Um, and, and we haven't talked about results for one day. Um, and we made a, a huge point of emphasis that, of that in the spring that, you know, fellas, we don't care about trying to get to however many wins, mm -hmm. you know, there is no three and oh, or four and oh, or whatever the record is, right. That can't be even a part of our mentality unless we take care of, you know, the first week first. So I, I really hope more than anything for the people that are kind of in that wait and see category of, of what does Allegheny football look like? We're going to truly take it one week at a time. You will not catch us looking ahead to any opponent because we're not fortunate enough to do that right now as a football program. We are laser focused on what's right in front of us. And we talked about even before trying to beat Waynesburg in week one, it's getting the most out of this spring, getting the most mm -hmm. out of the first week or getting the most out of that very first day of practice. Because once it's done, we can't get it back. And, you know, I, I felt like we scheduled the full allotment of spring practices. Um, and, and again, for us with our team, we, we try not to live in that gray area. We had our closing meetings with all the players. And I told him, guys, I thought we had 14 and a half good practices. So I, I want to make sure we understand that that's not good enough here. We had a lot of really good practices, but the expectation is if we take the field, we've got to get the most out of that day, right? Okay. So on the whole, it was a fantastic spring, but I mm -hmm. still want them to, to really focus on, we, we can't take any day for granted. We can't take any practice for granted. Um, and, and I want everybody that that's kind of looking at our program to understand that, um, we, we are very focused on what's directly in front of us. And we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. I'm, I'm sure you can tell. I'm, I'm a high energy guy. I've um, got a lot of excitement into what we're doing. Um, but that can never come at the cost of a relaxed atmosphere, a relaxed practice, or relaxed habits in what we do in that practice. Um, you know, we are very demanding in regards to getting better because that's what it takes in this conference. Now, Coach, we played we played in the same, same couple years. Um, my question for, for you specifically is, how much has the game changed since we'll say 08 could be 12? How much has the game changed over the time from your playing days to now being on the on the sideline as a coach? Um, yeah, I think a, a couple things. And again, I'm drawing more on my personal experience. I think recruiting is is drastically different. Mm -hmm. Um, just in regards to, I mean, I'm sure you remember I, I was cutting DVDs to like send them out to coaches. And I could only send them to a certain amount because it costs like $30 a pop to, to make a DVD. <laughs> and it was, you know, sitting down with your family to figure out, you know, what are the reach schools? What are the schools you feel comfortable with? What coaches asked to see film from your first three games of your senior year or, or whatever mm -hmm. it was, where I, I think nowadays, you know, you can send it to 800 coaches <laughs> with, with, with the click of a button. So I, I think yeah. the recruitment process um, has, has changed drastically. Um, and I do think, even in division three, the ability to put skilled players in space has changed um, in regards to what offenses are doing schematically. And then ultimately mm -hmm. how, how defenses react to change that. Um, I think the versatility of some of the three down front stuff you're seeing on defense, the three safety stuff that they're doing in the big 12, you know, everybody borrows steals, whatever you want to call it ideas from what <laughs> they see on film. Um, so th those two things are, are definitely different, um, especially from the Denison offense that, you know, I, played in as a quarterback my freshman and sophomore year um, and believe it or not we were still very 21 12 personnel um, heavy and, and then I was a wing tee quarterback in high school so it, it's changed a lot since then for sure I definitely have noticed over over the years as I've watched more college games and I'm further away from being a college graduate that it's it seems faster it seems like it's yeah. a faster faster paced game um 
I like to think we played a little bit more of a physical game back in the day <laughs> where now it's it's a little bit like, oh, I'd rather shove you out of bounds or give you a shoulder than than the full bo- full blown rap. Um, but so this and, and I think of- too, I mean, the the other thing that, that teams are doing really, really well is moving guys around. And and that's mm-hmm. something um, Austin Holter, he was the offensive coordinator at Denison for a long, long time. He's a college of Worcester quarterback. He's now the head coach at Worcester High School. Um, probably my my co- closest um, friend in the entire profession. Um, I, I thought he was really the first person that I saw do that. And I had the chance to work with him of, hey, hey we've got a really special wide receiver, right? Mm-hmm. Why would we only play him in the slot? Or why would we only align him at X or, or at Z, right? And, and really developing the mentality, and I'm sure you've heard it, of, players formations plays right and and understanding that instead of having that 400 page playbook and boy did we have a thick one my freshman year at Denison it's probably going to benefit us more to figure out who are our best players and how we can get them the football right a with numbers or b in space and that space aspect of it really comes a lot through for formations through shifts through alignment changes and making sure if we've got one or two just dudes that we need to make sure we isolate and we figure hey that's a better matchup for us how can we put that piece to the puzzle right where we want it to try to isolate specifically in my mind some downfield passing game stuff so like the Alex Victor years at Allegheny made my life really really easy (laughs) because it was more about how do we just figure out how to put him here and then let him run really fast straight up the field and break in one direction yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, coach. So this part has nothing to do with football. It's just it's five random questions. Oh boy! If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Uh, I'm convinced New Zealand. Even though I've never been there, I'm a diehard fly fisherman, and you've got nothing but trophy trout there. So, so New Zealand. My staff's going to make fun of me if they ever hear this. What's the most important lesson you've learned over your career? Um, I, I think the mentality really of, of making sure you don't ever take a day for granted. If you take a day off or if you take that deep breath and relax, um, there's somebody that's really, really hungry. That's just been given a position, um, where he or she has to go out and earn it. Um, and then they're going to take advantage of that. If you weren't coaching, would you be on ESPN right now? Is that where we, is that, was that the goal? Was that the, Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can tap myself on the back enough for ESPN. <laughs> I would give me uh, I, I would be on your local cable show like Friday at like 2 AM or 3 AM talk, talking about some, some sports. We could do that. Well, the, WPXI has the nightly sports call. We could just get you down to Pittsburgh and we'll get you on there. Sign me up. I'm in. I'm in. Best compliment you've ever received. Uh, I'm very slow. So I distinctly remember one time in sixth grade, uh, a kid told me I was fast. And like, I, I remember that as clear as day as a, <laughs> as a player, I could catch and I could jump, but that was the only time in my life. Someone's complimented my speed. So that that'll stick with me till the day I die. And on the other side of compliments, the best insult you've ever received. Uh, let's see. I, this is going to be really dated. People think like with my face and I, I got called Littlefoot from Land Before Time with a long neck. That's that's another one. Some of the college kids I played with. That's that's, that's another hard one. I probably shouldn't have said out loud. That's a creative insult. I mean, like that because that's the Dennis, taking it. The Denison guys dig deep. They dig deep. That's taking it back like early '90s. There's a lot of people. <laughs> there might be some players here watching this going, "Wait, what? Littlefoot? What the heck is that?" Yeah, they got no chance. No chance. Uh, the last question we've ended every show this way this season uh coach was there a question you were expecting me to ask and if so how would you have answered it question um how was Maine I, I usually get asked like what living up in the northeast was like um just just being up there um and I guess to answer it I, I absolutely loved it um you know we, we kind of already talked about it but at least I consider myself an outdoorsman. Um, mm-hmm. So that, that was a really cool place to be. Um, I mean, you, you could absolutely get lost in the North Main woods and, and fish and camp and hike um, for days without seeing anybody, which is kind of right up my alley. If you feel like you needed a day or two to unwind or, or enjoy um, being outside. So I absolutely loved it. Bowdoin itself was, you know, three miles from the ocean. So you also got to really enjoy the coastal aspect of Maine and um, man, just some of the most beautiful seas 
scenery and beaches and places you've ever been in your life. Um, if it was less than 14 hours away from Columbus, Ohio, and, and from my hometown and from my family, probably could have stayed there forever. But, um, you know, I, I absolutely love my time up there. So you're an off the we we what I gathered from that is you're an off the grid guy. You're a guy that I am. If, if we don't hear from you for a little bit, it's all right. He's just he went fishing, he's up in the woods, he'll come back. Just give him this give him some time and he'll make his way back down. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I got plenty of exploring to do in Pennsylvania now, that's for sure. Well, coach, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with us. I also want to say best of luck this season and congratulations on returning to Allegheny and uh you might see us the way I'm telling all the coaches this you might see us this fall we're, we're picking 10 games we're going to go to 10 different games this season hopefully um I don't know my girlfriend is the also the editor she's in charge of picking like where we go I'm going to pick the team she's going to pick where we go I don't see us going to many games in in October uh, I don't think she's really <laughs> mentally prepared for how cold a football game can get um but I want to say thank you again for stopping by for those of you that are sticking with us we're going to head it over to the editorial with serenity brown um and we'll be right back what's going on chuckleheads i am carla guadalina this is the editorial with serenity brown that's serenity brown this was coach lair from allegheny um go ahead wow started off strong you got his name wrong <laughs> I did. I did, you did, in fact. You did. I underlined the middle, and I forgot to ask him if it was Brandon or if it was Braden, and I went with what I thought. Don't do that. Correct. Don't do that. Ask. Um, uh, assuming makes out an ass out of me. Yeah. Well, I'm good at making an ass out of me. Anything else? Is that the only one? Is that the only mistake? Yeah. It was a good episode. He seems he seemed really excited to talk about the improvements not only they've already made to the program, but what also like he wants to do moving forward and stuff. Well, and as I said, the only of the of the new coaches coming into the PAC, the only program that the perennial power that is W and J and Coach Sirianni wanted to talk about is the fact that. You know, people forget that Allegheny was a power for a long time. And with the right guy in the right place, um, seems that things are moving in the right direction. They could be a very scary team. So um, I also thought it was interesting that he talked about, like, he want, there's a recruitment area that he wants to win. And it's interesting because I think he's going to – there's a big battle PAC-wise in that little – you know, there's like four teams the right there. there. Uh, maybe five teams right now. I think it's four. Allegheny, Teal, Grove City, and Westminster. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, thank you very much. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. If you're wa listening on, not watching, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you get podcasts, make sure you hit the little bell. Subscribe to us. Uh, that helps immensely. Also, you can follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. The only one that's different is the Instagram page, which is dingo underscore talk. Um, and the, we did something a couple nights ago. We're listing off things. So I'm going to pick the easy one for you. We're going to go five and five, Cartoon Network cartoons. You're putting me on the spot. I know we just did it the other night. Would you, Would you like me to start? Yeah. Um. I'm going to go with Mojo Jojo. In my oh, number stole, five spot. You stole one of the ones from my... Uh, yeah, this facility. would be your number five spot. Okay. I'm picking... Captain again from Flapjack. The Adventures of Flapjack. Number four. I are Baboon. <laughs> um... See, I told you, you put me on the spot and then my brain wipes... I can't think of a single Cartoon Network cartoon right now. There's an Asian guy that you named with a sword. Oh yeah, Samurai Jack. There you go. Number three, Johnny Bravo. Yeah. Um. There's a dog. There's three dogs. The 
uh, the the lizard principle from my gym partner is a monkey. Number two, Dexter. It's a good one. From Dexter's Lab. Um, hot dog. No, that's Nickelodeon. Really? We we did this how many times? Nickelodeon. Listen. There's like All six. All of the dogs. cartoons are just they're cartoons. They're not. That's that's false. You're gonna piss a lot of people off that like cartoons because that that's like saying that Star Wars and Star Trek are the same. Marvel and DC are the same. Okay, then then they're then the cartoons are not the same. Um. SpongeBob would never make it on Cartoon Network. The Cartoon Network fan base would not have gone with the SpongeBob thing. Isn't SpongeBob on Cartoon? No, Spongebob no, is Nickelodeon. No, Spongebob is Nickelodeon. 100%. Rocco, Hey Arnold, Rugrats, Doug. Fuck Doug. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. All right. Now, we're even going to finish the list. You, That's ridiculous. First off, Doug was just a hard-working high school kid trying to make it. Patty Mayonnaise treated him like absolute dog shit. He had a blue friend named Skeeter. And he liked the whatever the 90s version of the Beatles would have been. Because that's the beats. That's 100% yeah. who the beats are supposed to be. Um, well, now that... I don't remember anybody who was on my list from the other night. That's why I... My last one is is pretty easy. Uh, for those that watched Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I went to college with this guy. Spent six years with him. He ended up going down a terrible path. Um, and got his face broken. But uh, Plank. Plank is where we're going to end this episode. So, next week, I believe we are going into a new conference. I think we are, uh, I think we're going to not, we're going to get away from the PAC and the OAC. Um, we still have, I believe, one OAC coach left to air. Uh, we have an interview with a P, with the last of the PAC coaches that, that, signed on to do the show um but that's going to be a little further down the road as we're going to kind of jump into some of these new coaches that we have gotten the opportunity to talk to so without you got anything else no next week come prepared it's a top there's a top five list we are doing a top five list back and forth are you going to prepare me on what is probably not then i can't prepare <laughs> we'll see We'll see how it goes. You don't like planning meetings anyways, but we'll see you next week, Chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.